Hello everyone, I'm Denise, and you can't be here too long before you realize that Eastside is a church in many locations with new friends joining us all the time. If that's you, like maybe this is your first time here or you've been here for decades, we wanna welcome you to another great weekend at Eastside. And if you haven't done it yet, we invite you to pull out your phone and download the Eastside app. It's a great way to stay connected with us, with Gene, and if you're watching at home on your TV, you can use the app to connect with other Eastsiders in the chat. Just go to the Watch Live tab to start it up. The app really is a good resource. It even has message notes that you can follow along with. Now today, we're in part three of our Some Things Never Change series. And we're going to kick things off with our amazing worship team. So let's join them on the stage. Eastside starts right now. Welcome to Eastside, where we gather, all of us, each in different stage of our spiritual journey, young and old, all races and colors. We don't exist for ourselves, but for people, people that haven't been invited, people that haven't been cared for, who have walked away from God, people of a past that pushes others away. It's about the hurting and those who have lost hope. We gather as one church, not as individuals, not as separate campuses, but as a family pushing towards the same thing, knowing that Jesus was not for the select few, but for all of us. We believe Jesus is the hope in a world of darkness, and it's through his church that the world will find light. We believe who we choose to be today will determine the world of tomorrow. So we have a vision to begin each day with purpose, to open our hearts and minds to learn something new, to let go of our comfortable living, to reach the searching, the broken, the hurting, to focus on what really matters, to band together and fight against the darkness, a vision to be the church Jesus called us to be. This isn't just a church. Eastside is a movement of people who gather together with Jesus declaring, this is for everyone. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Eastside. Hey, if you're able, would you stand with us as we worship together today? Let's get those hands up. Sing our song. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. It's still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. Come on, we sing it out. This is my testimony from death. Yeah. 
we sing this out together today? that you are a consistent God, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we have that truth that we can rely on. God, you are a promise keeper. We worship you here today. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the 
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in. to worship together, you can go ahead and take a seat. And we love to share stories with you of how God is continuously moving through our church. So check this out. So we're going to Eastside Church, Las Vegas campus. We're headed there to get baptized today. Today's the day. Buddy. A year ago, we made the decision that we were going to sell our home in Orange County. And we felt like coming to Las Vegas was gonna be best for us. One of the things that was you know, difficult for us was we knew we were gonna have to leave Eastside. We were kind of bummed about it. And then the last service that we were at, uh, at Eastside Anaheim, Gene, said, hey, we're opening a new campus. And we looked at each other. I looked said, at Baz no and I'm way. like, what are the chances? What if he says Vegas? And he goes, no way. I told her there's no, no way. way. And then sure enough, he said Vegas. And I just broke down and started crying. Like, we just, I just think God is working in our lives right now and just putting us where we're supposed to be. Well, everyone, I'd like you to welcome uh, Basil and his wife, Erin. Baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. And I don't know, I, I just think if we weren't here at this church and it wasn't Tony, we probably would still be going, we'll get there at some point. And moving here just, I don't know, just God just kept leading us because I kept praying, use me, use me, use me. So finally being here, we're like, we don't know anybody, let's connect, let's plug in, let's do it. Unfinished has gotten me, like, involved with other people. That's the most rewarding. Like, we we reap the benefits of giving time. Like, I love the connections we've made. I love the feeling of getting out of your comfort zone. We committed to the unfinished financial side of it as well, in addition to our regular giving. And God's just always been, he's always provided. Like. And I'm telling you, more than we deserve, I can breathe because I know that no matter what happens, God will always get us through that. If, you know, they could put an east side on every corner, we'd, be a, we'd have a better world. So when we talk about the money part, like for me, that's important. I wanna be a part of that as much as I can. Getting to this point in a year, and I've grown that much in a year, I'm so unfinished, so I can't wait to see what the next year is, what the next year is. Like this stage that we're at right now is really cool. It's a great story, isn't it? God is doing some very cool things in Eastside East Side Las Vegas. Uh, my name's Scott, I'm on the team here. And I just wanna say welcome, happy summer. We're uh, squarely in summer now, right? You feeling it? You feeling good? 
Yeah, I like it. I like it. And I just want to emphasize after that video that any time that you're generous around Eastside, you're making an investment in the unfinished vision and the unfinished mission uh, that God is working in and around our church in multiple locations across the country. So just want to say thanks for that. Um, and just a reminder that there's three ways that you can be generous around Eastside on the Eastside app, on the Eastside website or at the giving boxes uh, in the back of the room uh, if you're interested in that. And if you're new around here, I just want to emphasize as well, we're just glad that you're here. We're just glad that you're here and a part of what, uh, you know, God's doing here today. And if you're new, also um, want to invite you to catch up this unfinished vision you might not know a ton about, uh, but there's a hub in the hallway that you can go and ask some questions and find out a little bit more about that. And if you're online, there's a part of our website that you can check out as well. But, um, you know, just would love to have you know more about what God is doing here. And if you're brand new around here, we'd love to invite you to stop by Guest Central uh, to meet someone, say hello, but also to get a little gift. Uh, I'd love to give you an Eastside travel mug and a voucher for a meal. Uh, our way of saying thanks for just showing up here and being a part of uh, what God is doing here and, and checking that out. So I mentioned summer, my favorite season, maybe yours as well, but summer at Eastside is a thing. Can I just say some very cool things happening around here. And one of them, as you walked in, you might have seen the small group expo uh, that's happening, ways that you can connect in community around here. And uh, earlier this week, someone actually asked my wife, she said, oh, you go to Eastside. That's a pretty big church, isn't it? And then she followed with saying, how do you get to know anybody there? How do you meet people there? And I thought my wife had an interesting answer. She said, well, it's kind of like when people go to a large university. Like, you meet your people. You don't know everybody there, but if you're there for a while, you can really meet some people. It changes your experience. And I just want to offer you this. I think that that's what small groups does. So if you want to stop by, just kind of kick the tires on some of those groups, explore that a little bit, you will not be disappointed in my estimation. So... Summer at Eastside also is marked today by a move up weekend with our next gen uh, kids and students. Kind of an exciting thing. You might have dropped your kid off in a new classroom today. Make sure you go back to the same classroom to pick up that same kid. That would be helpful. We had fifth graders. I was just over in the student center who've moved up into sixth grade. Pretty exciting time for them. And we have high schoolers who, uh, you know, eighth graders who are able to go to our high school ministry now on Sundays, which is a very awesome thing. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing them. I just want to say this to parents, though, if you're looking for a way to make church even more interesting for your kid and kind of uh, multiply the effect, consider having them bring a friend when they come, whether no matter what grade they're in. Uh, it really multiplies the experience, and it's a great time. We've got camps coming. We have all kinds of very cool things happening this summer in our Next Gen ministry. So last thing I want to mention to you from here is if you're trying to figure out a little bit more about how you get involved around Eastside or even what God might have for you for a next step, I want to invite you to our uh, experience called Next Steps. Week one is this weekend. Uh, you can do that online or you can do it at some of the times that are noted. But it's a great way to figure out what God might be kind of calling you towards, might be kind of pulling you towards. So just want to make that invitation as well. Hey, really glad that you came to church today. Excited for this next installment on our series. Uh, and glad that you're here with us at Eastside. How are you, Eastside? Everybody doing good? Good to see you this weekend. And uh, not only is this Move Up weekend in all of our Next Gen Ministries, which is very cool, but I know this is also graduation season. And uh, I wonder if we could just take a moment and celebrate with all of our high school and college graduates in Anaheim, Park Rapids, Vegas, Redlands, Bellflower, Irvine, all of our online family. We love you guys. We're so proud of you. So glad you're with us today. I've had the privilege over the years to speak for several college graduations, and it's always been intimidating to me. And I always feel like the college professor who stood up in front of his classroom one day and he said, 
are there any morons in our class today? He said, if there are, I'd like to ask them to just stand. Well, nobody stood. And so he asked again, if, if there are any morons in class today, please just stand. Nobody stood. And so he asked a third time, and finally, one lone freshman in the back of the room stood up, and the professor said, young man, are you a moron? And uh, the guy said, well, not really, sir, but I just felt sorry for you standing there all by yourself. <laughs> I feel like that guy every time I speak for a graduation. And you know, college is an exciting time. You're exploring, you're learning, and sometimes it, it like takes a couple of years to really kind of like declare your major. Maybe you change your major, and then you define and declare your future kind of life career path. And I think the process that I've just described academically is a little bit of the same process that many of you have recently gone through spiritually. Uh, I, I liken the, the period of spiritually exploring in your life where you're investigating to kind of a college student, their freshman year, where they're still just trying to figure out what they want to do and what they want to be and find out where the cafeteria is located and all that kind of thing. A beautiful thing has happened in hundreds of lives at Eastside since Easter. A number of you who came to an Eastside campus as spiritual explorers, you're not explorers anymore. Since Easter, last I heard, 439 of you have defined and declared your faith in Jesus through baptism. 439. And it's like, spiritually speaking, if I could, if I could liken it this way, you've, you've graduated and you're beginning your life adventure of faith. And today what I want to do is to challenge each of you who've recently been baptized or each of us who have made that decision at some other season in our lives to do what I think is the most important thing you can do spiritually for your future, and that is to dive deep into the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I know many of you are reluctant to do that. For instance, have you seen this t-shirt that says, Jesus, yes, church, no. And that spirit is a growing spirit in our day. It's, it's an idea that's gaining increasing popularity. It's the same spirit that Gandhi expressed many years ago when he said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. And you know, there may be a fair amount of you that to one degree or another, you have some similar feelings. And I get that. Some of the people that I've been most hurt by and most disappointed in life have been church people. So I understand why you might say, Jesus, yes. Church, no. Honestly, one of the things that keeps many people resistant to Christianity is there are so many bad versions of Christianity and bad versions of church, and some of you are products of that. I talk to people all the time who say, I, I feel kind of drawn to the church and what's being said, but I've got doubts and, and questions and a lot of skepticism about the church. I've got some church hurt in my past. Maybe you were a part of a church one time where the pastor had an affair or even abused people or there was some kind of scandal. Maybe you were a part of a church that was full of people who were mean-spirited and judgmental. Maybe they knew some of your colorful and sordid past and they treated you like you had a disease or something. Or you got involved and then the church split over something like the color of paint on the wall. That stuff really happens. And I just want to declare truth in advertising here. If you're looking for a church with a perfect pastor, please don't come to Eastside because I struggle with sin every day and sometimes I lose. Sometimes people come up to my wife, Barbara, and say, hey, it must be really great being married to a guy like Gene. And she just laughs. <laughs> Which is actually real progress because the first few years of our marriage, she would get the dry heaves. She knows the truth about me. And so I understand why people would say, Jesus, yes, church, no, because churches are made up of imperfect people like me. But friends, in spite of the church's imperfections, in spite of so many bad versions of the church out there that do more harm than good, I'm more optimistic than ever about the future of the church of Jesus Christ. And so today in our series, Some Things Never Change, I've titled this message, The Church Still 
prevails. People keep saying, the church is dead. I just don't see it. And today, I want to tell you why I'm bullish on the future of the church of Jesus Christ and why I unapologetically call you to dive deep with your life into the church of Jesus, whether it's east side or someplace else. Now, the first reason, honestly, is very personal to me. And it's because God has used the church to change my life. Do you know how long I've been in church? Let me show you. This is my mom holding me in a church pew. That's how long I've been in church. And it was in the church that I learned about a God that loved me. It was in the church that I learned about a Savior who died for me. It was in the church when I decided to say yes to Jesus by faith and went forward at a Sunday night service and was baptized into his death and burial and resurrection. And I'll never forget it. It was in the church that I learned to pray to a God who listens. It was in the church that change makers in preschool and grade school and junior high and high school volunteered and built into my life and in my soul. It was student leaders and youth pastors who saw gifts in me and spoke life-giving words like, Gene, you're a leader. Gene, you ought to be a pastor one day. It was in the church when I preached my first sermon at 14 years old titled Sharing Christ with Others, which I really hope has been the theme of my life. It was in a church that I learned, and I'm still learning, to be a Christ-like man, a Christ-like husband, a Christ-like dad and grandfather. It was in my lowest season back in the 80s when I went through a painful divorce, and it was the church that put their arms around me and unconditionally loved me and restored me back to wholeness. It was in the church, in an actual church worship service. In the middle of it, the Barbara and I were married 30 years ago last January. Barbara and I had an unusual wedding. You see, we kind of faced a unique dilemma. As the pastor of a large church in Vegas at the time, we wrestled with who should we invite to our wedding. We wanted to invite everybody in the church, but because of our limited facilities at the time, we would have been the first wedding in history to have multiple services. And it didn't seem right that we invited nobody when the church had walked with me and loved me through some tough times. So we just decided to get married at our church's midweek service on a Wednesday night. And whoever was there was there, okay? And it was an unforgettable night because nobody knew they were coming to our wedding. We had worship time like we've experienced today. We had some baptisms. And then Mike Bro, who's our teaching pastor and has been a close friend of mine for many years, got up to preach and he said, I know I'm supposed to teach right now, but instead I have two major announcements to make. He said, number one, Gene Apple and Barbara Cowan are engaged. And everybody clapped enthusiastically. And oh, that's wonderful. Our poor bachelor pastor has been so pitiful around here the past few years. We're so happy for him. And he said, number two announcement is you're at their wedding. They didn't clap. <laughs> there were gas, there was shock. Everybody thought Mike was kidding until family members who'd flown in from all over the country paraded in, sat down in the front row, and we had a wedding that night at church, and here it is. This is when bro had hair, okay? And I know you wouldn't believe me that bro had hair, so I brought this other picture taken of Mike and I at the reception later that night. That's Mike Bro right there. It really is. And come to think of it, I had a little more hair in those days too. But Barbara and I were married in the church. We've dedicated and raised our kids in the church. Our best friends and closest allies are in the church. Today, all of our kids are married. They live somewhere else around the country, but they're all plugged into and serving in their local church. Our grandchildren are being raised in the church. The church has multiplied our resources and touched lives and changed eternities and unleashed compassion. And even in recent weeks, as we've dealt with an excruciating loss in our family, it has been the love and the prayers and the comfort of the church of Jesus Christ that has carried carried us. Friends, for over six decades, God has used the church of Jesus Christ to change my life. I'm not saying I've never been hurt by the church of Jesus Christ because I've been hurt deeply from time to time. But in the church, I've learned to forgive 
and apologize for my own sins and faults. And I've experienced the blessing of being forgiven by people in the church who've shown me grace and mercy. And I want you to know my life has revolved around the work of God in the church of Jesus Christ for over six decades now, not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm paid to do this, but because I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm a part of the family of God in his church. And I'm so incredibly optimistic about the church of Jesus Christ for many reasons, but one is simply, it's just changed my life. And that's What amazing is, you know, we could take this microphone right now, we could pass it around the room on every campus today, and you would hear story after story of how God has worked in your life and through your life and in your family and in your kids through the church, not because the church was perfect, but because God used an imperfect church to bring you to a perfect God. Amen? Amen. Now... Second, I feel like I could just stop right now, right? Second, I'm optimistic about the future of the church of Jesus Christ because the vision of the church is so compelling and life-changing. You know, a river is purest at its source. And so I want you to go back with me. I want to look at the birth and the life and the vision of the very first church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. The apostle Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, preaches to thousands in the streets of Jerusalem. And here's what happens next. He preaches about Jesus, and it says, Acts 2.41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. 3,000 people at one time in one setting from one sermon were born again and changed by Jesus. 3,000 lives experienced forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000, if you think of it, spiritual explorers became spiritual graduates that day. And so now Peter and the rest of the apostles got to figure out how in the world are we going to provide spiritual care for all these new vulnerable new followers of Jesus. And I've always had a feeling that between Acts 2.41 and the very next verse, Acts 2.42, the apostles got together and they had some planning sessions, some prayer meetings. And out of that, they established four basics or four priorities, four values, four practices that they were going to challenge these new spiritual graduates to, that I kind of think of that first group of 3,000 as the class of 33 A.D. And they would challenge them to devote themselves to these four things for the rest of their lives. And the task fell to Peter and the other spiritual leaders to challenge these new followers of Jesus to four basics. And here they are. Verse 42. They devoted themselves... First to the apostles' teaching, second to fellowship, third to the breaking of bread, and fourth to prayer. Peter and the other leaders made no apologies in challenging all 3,000 freshly baptized graduates to just devote themselves, to invest themselves, to dedicate themselves to these four spiritual practices. And the amazing thing is, they did it. They simply put on the blinders and they said, these four practices will become the top priority of our lives. And over time, the results were absolutely incredible. If you've ever wondered what a church looks like when it's working right, This is it. This is God's compelling vision for his church. And look what happens in the aftermath. The next verse. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions so they could give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Friends, that's the dream for every church. That's the dream 
I'm giving my time, my energy, my prayers, my resources, and my very life for. And I covenant with you as your pastor to never let go of this dream and to pay any price for that dream and to show up every day with a serving towel over my arm and on my knees for that dream. And did you notice that last little phrase down there? Right down at the very bottom. That the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why? Why? because of the dramatic transformation that the Holy Spirit was doing in the lives of all these new believers living out that dream. And their neighbors and their family would look at them, these transformed followers of Jesus, and say, I want what they have in my life. I want that in my marriage. I want that in my family. And all those dramatic results can be traced back to these 3,000 graduates devoting themselves to just these Four basics that Peter prescribed. The class of 33 eventually became the leadership and the serving core of the Christian movement as it spread throughout the Roman Empire and eventually to the ends of the earth. And I think it's fair to wonder if there would even be an east side today if it weren't for the faithfulness of the class of 33. These 3,000 graduates, every bit as ordinary, every bit as busy, every bit as timid and stubborn and sinful as you and me, responded to the challenge to incorporate these four basics into their lives. Now, could I talk candidly for a few minutes to the class of 2023? And for a few minutes, I just want to challenge each and every one of you to do exactly what Peter challenged the class of 33 to do and just dive deep into these four practices. And I'm not going to shrink back an inch. First, I want to challenge you to devote yourself to teaching. Peter says, everybody devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, which simply means God's word, the Bible. You see, at that point in time, they didn't have the Bible assembled like we have in our books today or on our smart devices. It was the divinely inspired words of the apostles, the apostles' teaching, that became our Bible. So they didn't have stand, someone stand up at the front and say, hey, let's all open our Bibles today to 2 Peter chapter 3. No, they just turned to Peter and said, teach us. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The Bible is our nourishment. It's what feeds our souls. You see, what we eat determines our health. And the same applies spiritually. And so could I just challenge you to devote yourself to the public teaching that occurs whenever the church gathers for weekend services? A wife woke up her husband one Sunday morning to go to church, and he rolled over and said, I'm not going. And his wife was exasperated with his attitude and said, give me two reasons why. And he said, well, one, because nobody there likes me. And two, I don't really like them. And she persisted, and she said, well, you got to go. He said, give me two reasons why. And she said, well, first, because God's word says you need it. And second, you're their pastor. <laughs> we all need these times of spiritual nutrition. The Bible says don't miss the assembling of yourselves together with the church. Plan your schedule. Plan your life around devoting yourself to that kind of teaching because something supernatural happens when we're all together that could change your life. A second kind of teaching opportunity you might want to think about plugging into is in a small group. We're launching our summer small groups this week. That would be a great time to jump into a gathering like that. A third kind of teaching is actually the greatest kind, and that's when you read and study the Bible on your own. Some of the best Bible teaching you'll ever experience is when you open up God's Word and you just say, Word of God, speak. And if you don't have it, man, I would encourage you to download the free version app of the Bible on your phone. It has hundreds of Bible reading plans, different translations. You can just listen to the Bible if you want to. Or you could join me most Monday through Fridays. I do a little podcast, five minutes, just a five-minute dose of God's Word in your life to help you begin, end, or get through your day. Listen, I've never known a strong, effective mature follower of Jesus that God was using in a significant way that was not totally devoted to Bible teaching. 
According to Peter, a second absolute essential for diving deep in your faith spiritually is to devote yourself to community. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to one another, to community, to relationships, to the body of Christ. And I think maybe this is the one that Peter talked about with the most enthusiasm and emotion. I can almost hear Peter say to the class of 33, hey, you know, you're talking to one who knows the value of community because three years ago, I was the owner of an independent fishing business. And independent kind of describes me really well. But then Jesus of Nazareth called me to follow him. And I got drafted into a small group of 12 of the strangest humanoids I have ever met. And over the next three years, we walked together. And we talked together. And we traveled together. And we ate meals together. And almost without even realizing it was happening, we became like brothers together. And I picture Peter getting kind of choked up on this one. And maybe looking out at the class of 33 and then off to the side, he sees his brothers, the disciples, his close friends. And I can just hear him say to those guys, hey, I love you guys. My life would be incomplete without you in it. And I have a feeling that was enough for every single person in the class of 33 to say, that's it. I'm devoting myself to community for the rest of my life. And gang, I would just encourage every one of you to do that. Do it formally through our small groups at Eastside. Or if you haven't yet, jump in and experience all four weeks of Next Steps at any one of our campuses. That's kind of a great on-ramp where you kind of, for four weeks, you can drive a, test drive a smaller group, see how it works for you. Today, we have our small group expo on every campus. You can check out opportunities for this could be a really cool summer for you. According to Peter, another absolute essential to diving deep in your spiritual life is to devote yourself to prayer. Maybe you can identify with the, the person who prayed, Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy, nasty, or selfish. I haven't lied. I haven't stolen or cheated. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And that's when I'm going to need a lot of help. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus very long before you realize you need a lot of help. And friends, prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. One of the things that's so helpful for me each morning, it's just my practice. The first thing I do when my alarm goes off is I just lay in bed for two or three more minutes and I just start my day praying. And it's just a simple prayer. I just say, God, it's a new day. And I don't want to go through this day without you. So I just say together today, God, together today, I want to walk through this day with you. I want to listen to you, be used by you, empowered by you. Finally, Peter teaches the fourth absolute essential for diving deep spiritually is to devote yourself to communion or what he calls to the breaking of bread. Communion is the regular coming together of the whole church to remember what Jesus did for us when he allowed the Roman soldiers to beat him and mock him and, and whip him and strip him naked and pound nails in his hands and his feet and hoist him up on the cross for public ridicule for our salvation. And I want to save some of my comments on this for just a little later because today all across our Eastside campuses, I'm going to lead us in a time of communion and eating the bread, and drinking the cup together. Friends, the church of Jesus Christ spread like wildfire in the first century because of their devotion to these four basics right here. And like the class of 33, if we get this right, there is no end to what God will do in our lives as unfinished people and through this church and Eastside's unfinished story. In fact, let me ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if, if God the Holy Spirit were just kind of to speak audibly into your ear right now, just whisper into your ear, which one or two of these four areas would he say, you know, this one kind of needs the most attention right now, or here's a couple that need more attention than the others. You need to devote yourself more to, would it be teaching, 
community, prayer, communion. I hope you'll pay attention to that nudge you're getting right now from the Holy Spirit. I'm optimistic about the future of the church of Jesus Christ because the vision of the local church is so compelling. Now, lastly today, I'm optimistic about the future of the church of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the one who said, I will build my church. It's not our church, it's his church. And he said he would build his church. I love the fact that Jesus is the first person in the Bible to mention the church. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gives his disciples a little pop quiz and says, hey guys, who do people say that I am? And they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, ding, 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 ding. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that statement by saying, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build what? Build what? My church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the church will prevail. Even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. You see, the great thing about the church of Jesus Christ is that it's not led by a flawed guy like me. It's led by a perfect leader like Jesus Christ. And for 2,000 years, the gates of hell have not prevailed. And Jesus just keeps building his church in spite of its flaws, in spite of its warts, in spite of attacks. Jesus' enemies thought they had defeated him when they crucified him on a cross. But the gates of hell did not prevail. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. A few weeks later, Jesus ascended into heaven. And some thought it was the end. But that first small group of 12 grew to 120. And then it exploded on the day of Pentecost when over 3,000 people were baptized. And the gates of hell did not prevail. But then it looked bleak in the year 38 AD when Stephen was stoned to death for following Jesus. And the church scattered. And as a result, the most effective form of church planting that only God could have dreamed up unfolded. And soon churches started sprouting up in cities like Thessalonica and Ephesus, which had 20 to 30,000 believers. A church in Antioch grew to over 100,000 believers and the gates of hell did not prevail and Jesus built his church. From 250 to 261 AD, the church experienced the decade of horror. When thousands of Jesus followers were murdered, slaughtered, beheaded, crucified, thrown to wild animals, and tortured because they dared to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. But the gates of hell did not prevail. And Jesus built his church. And throughout the centuries, the church has survived scandals and dark periods and embarrassing, tragic fiascos like the Crusades, which were a horrible expression of religious abuse. But through it all, the gates of hell did not prevail, and Jesus built his church. In the mid-20th century, there was a leader named Mao Zedong who launched the Chinese Communist Revolution, again, trying to stamp out Christianity in China. He kicked out every Western missionary in 1949, including some of our our own. And everybody thought, oh, the church in China is going to die. What are they going to do? Well, here's what they're going to do. All of the converted Chinese people started becoming pastors and the underground church began to gain life through the power of the spirit. And today Mao Zedong is dead, but the church in China is alive and growing faster right now than anywhere else in human history. And the gates of hell did not prevail. And Jesus built his church. Fast forward to 1979. There was this Iranian revolution and the government leaders established a hardline Islamic regime, regime and they kicked out all the missionaries. They outlawed evangelism and Bibles were abandoned and several pastors were publicly tortured and executed. Many people feared at the time that this tiny little Iranian church, it was less than 500 Christians in all of Iran, would wither and die. 
and yet more Iranians have become Christians in the last 20 years than in the previous 13 centuries combined. There are over a million Iranian Christians meeting as the underground church right now, and the gates of hell did not prevail, and Jesus is building his church. Now listen, people for over 20 centuries have been saying, 20 centuries, the church is going to die. The church is going to die. The church is going to die. But gang, listen to me. Jesus said he will build his church and the gates of hell will never, ever, ever be able to stop it. Persecution couldn't stop it. Communist takeovers couldn't stop it. Islamic terrorists couldn't stop it. The secular media can't stop it. Cynical college professors can't stop it. Antagonistic politicians can't stop it. Why? Because some things never change and 2,000 years ago, Jesus made a promise. I will build my church and Jesus keeps his promises. And so today, I'm filled with hope. I'm filled with optimism. I'm bullish for the vision of the church of Jesus Christ. Don't ever bet against the church of Jesus Christ. God used the church to change my life, and he's changed your life. And the Acts 2 vision of the local church is so compelling and so life-changing. And because Jesus is the one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and the church still prevails. Amen? Now today, you and I, we have the privilege of coming together just like the church did in Acts chapter 2 and devoting ourselves to the practice of communion, the Lord's Supper. When you arrived today, you should have received one of these kind of two-for-one communion cups. And if you didn't get one, just raise your hand at any one of our campuses and keep it up until one of our change makers can, can find you and they'll bring you one at whatever campus you're at. Just keep your hand up, they'll find you. If you're at home, I want to just invite you to find whatever elements you have available to you. And if you're not comfortable in partaking in communion today, no sweat. I just want you to know there's a, there's this chair with your name on it at the communion table of Jesus Christ whenever you're ready to follow him as your savior. We come to this table today as one church gathering in diverse campuses. Think about this. One church gathering in Northern Minnesota, urban Los Angeles County, suburban Orange County, wild west of Redlands, the bright lights of Vegas, and from homes and computers all across the nation and the world. We come to this communion table with diverse ages and backgrounds and ethnicity and skin colors, life experiences, introverts and extroverts, political liberals and political conservatives. And in this moment, we do something dramatic. We do something radical. We defy the global tide of divisiveness that's pulling the world apart. And we come together as one family declaring we are one in Jesus. We are his. We are bought with the price of Jesus' body and blood. And when you eat and drink, you're declaring your commitment to the church of Jesus Christ. And that the people gathering in our church family across communities and states and even countries today are closer allies to you than your political allegiances, than your workplace allegiances, than your sports allegiances. We are a spiritual family on earth. And even better, we will be an eternal spiritual family forever in heaven. So Jesus looked around at his disciples in the upper room when they gathered and he took the bread. And you remember he broke it so that we would remember his body broken for us. So today, together in unison, as one church family, let's eat this bread together with a spirit of repentance for our sins and gratitude for his amazing grace. And then in the 
similar way Jesus took the cup. And as we do it today, let's do it as a statement of our commitment to the mission and to the vision and to the values of his church. Because the one who shed his blood for us is building his church through us. And the gates of hell will never, ever, ever prevail against it. Let's drink together. And now at every campus, could we just stand together across all of our campuses? Let's bow our heads together. I want to lead us in a prayer and then our worship teams are going to lead us in a closing song of celebration and declaration. Jesus, I thank you today for your promise to build your church. I thank you for changing my life through the church of Jesus Christ over and over again. I thank you for changing lives throughout uh, every room and campus and gathering of Eastside today where people are just full, thousands of us changed by Jesus forever. We thank you for this compelling vision of a church where joy overflows, where unity is happening and there's answered prayers and people are coming to faith daily because of the devotion to your word and to prayer and to fellowship and to breaking of bread together. And God, we pray that you will continue to build your church. Thank you that nothing in 20 centuries has ever, ever, ever been able to destroy the church of Jesus Christ and that the church will prevail because Jesus is the one who is building them. Thank you, Jesus, for building your church in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you for building your church through our lives and through East Side. And we unite our prayers together today in the name of you, Jesus, our Savior, our King, and our Lord. And everybody agreed together and said, And the church of Christ was born. church, isn't it? It's a good day in church. Hey, uh, you can stay standing before you walk out. A couple of things if you want to stop by. The uh, Small Group Expo really would encourage you to think about that. If you're uh, new with us today, please, please stop by Guest Central. We would love to uh, meet you and say hello. And now it's time for us to go out and be the church in the world. Agree? I agree. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Gene, for reminding us that Jesus still saves and God is still for us. And not only that, but so is your church. And what I mean by that is a new round of small groups starts this week. Small groups makes it easier to meet new people, grow in our faith, and do more of what we love together. Small groups really do make a difference. My small group literally changed my life for the better. And if you're not in a group yet, give it a try. 
Summer groups are starting up soon, and if you're on a physical campus, check out the options being showcased there. And if you're online, go to eastside.com slash groups to view all the options available to you. And before you go, remember that a new round of Next Steps starts this weekend. It's a great time to join and to get more out of your Eastside experience. Just go to eastside.com slash Next Steps for all the details. Thanks for hanging out today, everyone. Take care, and we'll see you next time.